Hi everyone, welcome to the 10 on 10 series day 8 and you know we are solving 10 questions all throughout. Last class we had a twist where instead of 5 questions and 5 images I give you all 10 questions together. So today there's another twist because now today I'm going to discuss all 10 images and with every image that you identify I will be giving you 10 P by Q pointers or MCQs that have come alongside. So let's get going for this very short session but something which is very very important. Get going with the very first question that we have. You have a gastric aspirate or a biopsy. There's an image of a stain and a particular test with a pink color positivity given over here. I hope you could identify this is the classical helicobacter pylori and helicobacter pylori always goes and affects the stomach and in the stomach it is responsible for causing two very important cancers. One is known as adenocarcinoma of the stomach and the other is maltoma which is a kind of a lymphoma of the stomach. Now the stain that has been given over here is the WSSS that is Warden Starry Silver Stain. I think I've told you a million times silver always gives us a black color so H. pylori appears black. Now what is this pink color positivity that I see over here? That's the enzyme that H. pylori produces that is urease. So it is a urease positive organism. All said and done, question 1 is over. Moving on to question 2. Here we have a history of a female with a mucocutaneous pigmentation and there is some biopsy. I've not even given you the site because I hope that this is very classical. This is the classical Peutz-Jagger syndrome. So, of course, this must have been an intestinal biopsy which is showing us a polyp which is known as the classical arborizing or the Christmas tree polyp. So, here you can see although it doesn't look like a Christmas tree but yes, it's a Christmas tree polyp. In the NEAT PG previous years, it has been asked that what is the thing that is making the branches of this tree and if I zoom into it, I can see some fibers which are going like this and making branches. These are actually the smooth muscle fibers which are making the branches of that arborizing tree. Another question question that has been asked in the previous years is what is the genetics and the age of this Peutz-Jagger syndrome. Before I talk about that, I hope you remember the mnemonic P for Peutz and P for pigmentation, J for Jaggers, in fact J E for Jaggers. So the most common site of this polyp in the intestine is going to be the jejunum. Now talking about the genetics, it is a mutation in the STK11 or the LKB1 gene and please note it's a story of 1111. So the age after which this particular condition starts manifesting is after 11 years of age and and the gene is going to be STK11. So as I said, with the image, we are doing the respective PYQ. Moving on to question 3, which has come again and again in FMG and NEAT, is this kidney picture. Usually the radiology comes, I feel even the gross can come. And whenever it comes, there is a history of sterile pyuria, pus cells in the urine, sterile pyuria. This is a case of putty kidney, which you see in a case of TB. And what is the classical finding of cheesy appearance given over here? That's the caseous necrosis. Very, very important. You know every question on TB is important. Moving on to question Question 4, which is another gross appearance that we have from the kidney, a classical spotter, no need for any kind of a history. The only picture available on the internet of a waxy kidney. Whenever we use the word waxy, we are talking about amyloidosis. The PYQs that has been asked over here is on this, what is the gross stain? Don't mark Congo red everywhere when you read amyloid. I've asked you for a gross stain means what can I put on top of this kidney specimen? And the answer is Lugol's iodine, which is going to give a mahogany brown color. Please note, after this, in some neat PG exams, it can be asked that when you put Lugol's iodine, you get a mahogany brown color. And to on top of this mahogany brown, when you put sulfuric acid, you will get a bluish color. And that will basically tell you that amyloid somewhere has properties very similar to starch. That's why it's staining with iodine. Now coming back, your favorite, Congo red. So that's a micro soapy stain. When you put Congo red and you visualize it under light microscope, you get a salmon pink color. When you visualize it under polarizing microscope, how can we forget the classical apple green birefringence? But I have another PYQ that instead of Congo red, they ask you, is there any other microscopic stain? And they might ask you that if you're using UV light, which stain will you use? You will use thioflavin T because T will go as TUV. So UV light stain is thioflavin T. Question 4 is also done. Moving on to question 5 where you have an ovarian mass in a very very young child, 3 year old child. I can only think of one that has to be a yolk sac tumor. So the bodies that is shown over here because the age is very classical of yolk sac and the body shown over here is a shillodual body. Shillodual body is known as glomeruloid body. It looks like a glomerulus. Why? Because a glomerulus will always have a blood vessel in the center and this also has a reddish looking blood vessel in the center as I 
can label it. What else? Apart from that, I can see one row of tumor cells and another row of tumor cells. Can I see it in the actual photo? Yes, I can see one row of tumor cells and then I can see another row of tumor cells and what are they separated by? They are separated by a space in between and I can see that whitish color spaces here as well. So now I know there's a blood vessel in the center, then there are two rows of tumor cells and they are separated by a space in between and that is a Schiller dubel or a glomeruloid body seen in yolk sac tumor. The PYQ has been very obvious every time. What is their tumor marker? It is always alpha fetoprotein. Alpha fetoprotein is number one for yolk sac tumor. Apart from that, for two liver cancers or tumors also, it is a tumor marker. One is hepatocellular carcinoma and the other is a childhood liver tumor known as hepatoblastoma. Another question that I want to ask you, apart from alpha fetoprotein for neat PG students, please note sometimes alpha 1 antitrypsin can also be a tumor marker for yolk sac tumor. Moving on to question 6, every time you always get a breast lump and a biopsy, elderly 50 year old female, obviously you start thinking more in terms of cancer. This is the biopsy picture. I hope you have identified the classical Indian file pattern because like Indian army men, very disciplined, the tumor cells are very disciplined. They are standing in a straight line. So you can see these straight line cells one behind the other. That's the Indian file pattern and that is seen in invasive lobular carcinoma. That's the diagnosis also written as ILC. Now the previous year question is that not always but this tumor can many a times be bilateral and it can be multicentric so if a female has an invasive lobular carcinoma of say left breast always examine the right breast also or keep her in follow-up because it might be bilateral in the future why does this occur? Genetics. It is because of a down regulation of a protein called E cadherin. E cadherin is with gene CDH gene. And this is mutated or down regulated in two tumors. One is invasive lobular carcinoma and the other is diffuse gastric cancer. And these are also previous year questions. Moving on to question 7, which is a PYQ of path and micro, where you have to tell me all the different tennis rackets of path and micro with four images given in front of you. The first one is only for neat PG students. This is something to do with the soft tissue tumor. When you get a history of a soft tissue tumor, you know there is only one that can show you tennis racket cells that is rhabdomyosarcoma. Sarcoma means cancer, myo means muscle and rhabdomyo means skeletal muscle. So this is a cancer of the skeletal muscle and it shows you tennis racket cells. If you look carefully, the cells are elongated. They are not round usually like the cells are. They are little stretched out like tennis rackets. In the next one, I don't think you require a history because it's a classical black and white electron microscopy showing you tennis racket. This has to be LCH, Langerhans cell histiocytosis and today's homework is going to be on LCH and homework I will give you right at the end where you will tell me three questions on LCH that I'll mention in the end. Moving on to the third one, if you have a stool sample in which you're seeing some parasite which is tennis racket, this is having two nuclei and it has those four pairs of flagella, oh, this is the angry old man of the intestine that is Giardia lamblia. Finally, coming to a bacteria which can be tennis racket. Most students answer this as Clostridium tetani, but I hope you know Clostridium tetani does not look like a tennis racket. That looks like a drumstick. Very similar, but names are different. Clostridium tertium because tennis racket is shown by Clostridium tertium. All the tennis rackets are done for you. Moving on to question 8. One immunoglobulin every time comes in the exam. I mean, I didn't even want to ask you. This is an immunoglobulin which is obvious, but which immunoglobulin is the question that is coming? And we will always get the sequence written as GAMD. Reason being that from maximum concentration to least concentration it is going to be IgG AMDE. So G has max concentration, E has least concentration GAMD. Out of them, which is the one that is going to always come as a dimer? Dimer means that you will see that there are two antibodies which are stuck together and that is going to be IgA. In the recent INICT exam, it was asked that what is this particular antibody and because of the dimeric structure everyone identified, what I want to add on is that these two antibodies are joined by something known as the joining chain and to double tape it and to make sure that they stay together, there is another thing joining them and that is known as the secretory protein. Now that is a dimeric, if they give you something which is multimeric, then that is going to be the classical IgM. Apart from that, we have other antibodies that is GAMD, right? We have to do the full spectrum. So how do I learn it? Please note, you always have to lead, uh, read the constant uh, region of the heavy chain. This is something only for neat PG, not required for FMG. For FMG, please remember dimeric is IgA and multimeric is IgM. But for the others, what are you supposed to do? You will always pick up the heavy chain. So I am highlighting the inner longer one, of course, all of you know, is going to be the heavy chain. And in the heavy chain, you will always look at the constant region. I hope you remember the ones that are at the terminal ends, those are always the variable region. So let me mark all the variable regions for you. But the ones that are going to be otherwise inside, those are constant regions. 
regions let's start counting how many constant regions are there constant region 1 constant region 2 and 3 so 1 2 and 3 most of them have three constant regions but then this has 1 2 3 4 there are some which have four constant regions coming to this one it has three constant regions coming to IgM this again has four constant regions coming to IgA that again if I highlight it and I remove all these previous markings that again has three constant regions so ma'am how will I know three versus four please note me me that is IgM and IgE repeating for you once again this must be IgE because it has four constant regions and this must be IgM because of multimer and this also has four constant regions so IgE and M have four constant regions in the heavy chain hence they are M and E whereas the other ones that IgG A and D they have three constant regions so automatically these become the G A and D antibodies I hope you are able to identify the dimer multimer the constant regions four versus three coming on to the ninth image that we have is of course a card test no one will ask you they will ask you the principle of every card test which is immunochromatography testing also written as ICT in the paper now that card test could be for anything starting from malaria to COVID to hepatitis B it could also be for hepatitis C it could be for HIV and these will all require blood samples maybe in a urine sample you're doing it for urine pregnancy for everything the principle is immunochromatography what does it contain can you see this membrane that is present inside on which the blood or the urine will flow that is going to be a nitrocellulose membrane another PYQ coming on to the last question how can you forget everyone's favorite plate the ELISA plate enzyme linked immunosorbent assay my first question what are the total number of tests that can be done total wells please note in one side we have 12 wells on the other we have 8 wells so we have a total of 12 into 8 that is 96 wells that an ELISA plate carries now if you read that full form it is enzyme linked immunosorbent assay immuno means that I am definitely going to add some antibody into this testing and enzyme means that I am going to add some enzyme and that enzyme is HRP just read the name once it is horse radish peroxidase A's will tell me it's an enzyme so that's the enzyme that I'm adding this is the antibody that I'm adding but in the end ma'am when you look at this plate it will give you some kind of a color to know whether the test is positive or not so for that the chromogen that we are adding is usually benzidine these are some questions that have come in previous year for micro and biochem for ELISA. Of course, types of ELISA I will teach you when we have the immunology class. On that, we have wrapped up today's session of 10 on 10. I will be meeting you now for day 9, but these are the three homeworks of the day on Langerhans cell histiocytosis. Number 1, you have to tell me the mutation. Number 2, you have to tell me the tennis racket appearance that I showed you over there were of which granules of Langerhans cell. And number 3, you have to tell me the CD markers. So all these three are your homeworks for the day and as always, I will be following it up in the comments see you again for the next session which will be day 9 where we'll probably have another twist in the series but i hope you're enjoying it see you soon